Hey everyone and welcome to the next study. I'm so glad that you are going to be following along with me. Hopefully you have your Bibles out as well. So for this study we're going to be looking at the doctrine of the Antichrist. This is present in many different churches including the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. So let's start it off with our theme verses as always. 1 Corinthians 4 3, you are of God little children have overcome them because he who is in you that's the Spirit of Christ, Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world. That's Satan. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard some uh, Christians say, Oh, I'm full of the spirit. Well, the question is, which spirit? And that's the reason I have the, the picture of the angel in the upper left-hand corner. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. We have to be very careful about the, the spirits and ask for that spiritual discernment so we can tell the difference. And then we'll read a little bit about the synagogue of Satan from Jeremiah 8, 8. How can you say, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. The wise men are shamed, they are dismayed and taken, which means they are destroyed. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, so what wisdom do they have? So this is a prophecy from Jeremiah 8 that occurs at the end of time. You're going to have a people that supposedly keep the letter of the law, but yet they rely on the wise men to interpret scripture to them for them rather than having the scripture interpret themselves and what is their end state they end up rejecting the word of the lord and they end up actually becoming fools so those are the theme verses let's um, transition on and let's ask a question here what does the sda church teach about the nature of christ so to answer that question, we will look at their fundamental belief number four, God the Eternal Son. So I have to stop it right there and ask all of you Christians out there, where in Scripture do we find that um, term or that moniker used in Scripture? We don't. It is not biblical. God the Eternal Son or God the Son does not exist in Scripture. Okay, let's move on. Became incarnate in Jesus Christ. Through him all things were created. The character of God is revealed. Salvation of humanity is accomplished, and the world is judged forever, truly God. Okay, so here we have the idea of co-eternal, co-equal, which is, of course is tied in with the Trinity. That's why I have a picture of the triune God there to the left. But we have some questions um, here. If Christ was forever, truly God, this has to do with the nature of Christ when he was on the earth. So if he was forever truly God, then we can derive some simple points here. Number one, he overcame sin by his own divinity. If that divinity dwelled in him, then that was how he overcame sin. It wasn't through reliance on the Father. Point number two, he wasn't tempted in all points as we are. If you have divinity within you, then it would be a lot easier to endure sin, pain, and suffering to know that that divinity can never die. So that, that is another point we have to consider. And then the last point, um, if that divinity was in him and he was truly forever God, that means he, was co he is co-eternal, as the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches, that means he cannot die. And so when I've got a couple of sentences here, but what it comes down to is that is spiritualism. If the body dies and the spirit lives on, that is spiritualism, and that's what the corporate Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches today. So let's look and ask the main question of this study. What is the doctrine of the Antichrist? And you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we have the amalgam beast, we have the Pope in the middle of that picture, and we have Ganun Diop on the far right. He is, he was, he is or was the head of the religious liberty branch for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So let's read 1 John 4.2. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets. Okay, so we've already got a false spirit, and we've got a false prophet in this verse. Have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God 
and this is the spirit of the Antichrist. So right there, we have the answer to our question. The the spirit that does not come, that does not acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh is not of God. So we have to figure out what in the flesh means according to Scripture. And for that, I just want to talk briefly about William Miller's rule number five of Bible study. Um, it is worth mentioning. Uh, scripture must be its own expositor since it is a rule of itself. If, if I depend on a teacher to expound it to me and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed or thought to be wise, then his guessing, desire, creed, or wisdom is my rule and not the Bible. So we don't need the wise man to explain Scripture to us. And, you know, William Miller's thought here is actually buttressed perfectly by John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the pure word of God is what sanctifies us, and it's perfect. And if we want to know what the Bible teaches about something, we let the Bible tell us by looking at all the other examples and the same root word, and it can teach us in that way. So with that said, what does uh, in the flesh mean? The, specifically the word flesh. So here we have the Greek word sarx. And so we're going to now proceed and we're going to read some other Bible verses that will explain to us what the word flesh means so we don't have to guess. So John 1.14, 4, and the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, flesh, human. Uh, Hebrews 2.11 For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is calling us brothers and sisters, saying, I will declare to you the name of my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will pray, sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. Of course, that's the Father. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh, sarks, that is our existence as sinners, our nature is a sinful one, and, and that is exactly what, what it is saying here. And blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Okay, that is very, very clear. Let's go on to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets, the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Um, the seed of David was not, did not have divinity dwelling in them. If you say it did, then we have a whole new set of doctrines. Uh, Romans 6.18 and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, sarks. For just as you were presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So here we have the flesh is weak and it's also lawless. So again, human nature. Romans 7, 5. For when we were in the flesh, sarks, the sinful passions that were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bring fruit to death. Romans 8, 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal, sarks, mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law, nor indeed can it be. Romans 13, 13, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, sarks, to fulfill its lust. Matthew 26, 40, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to them, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, sarks. So let's take a verse, a couple of verses here, which will accurately summarize, I think, all of the points that we just hit on. Hebrews 4.14, 4, Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. So that all points is exactly how it is written. It is every single point. And if Jesus had divinity in him, and that's how he overcame sin, he would not be tempted in us as all points. So I want to make that 
known. And then we'll move on a little bit. Uh, the spirit of the Antichrist is also the spirit of the world, which is the unholy spirit from Satan. This emanates from the prince of the power of the world, which is Satan. It is the same spirit that convinces you to remain in the Laodicean condition. And now we have the prince of the power of the air, that spirit actually speaking. Jesus didn't overcome sin by submitting to the will of the Father, so neither do you. You don't have to overcome sin, even though Scripture says you do, by submitting to Jesus into your life and dying daily. That's what the spirit of this world said. It isn't necessary. Jesus didn't die to self, so neither do you. And so let's go back to the original lie from that prince, Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not surely eat of the, every tree of the garden? That's always Satan's desire, is to create unbelief in the word of God. That's his MO, and he sticks with it throughout all his existence. John 14, 30. I will not say much to you anymore. This is Jesus speaking. For the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. The prince of the world was coming in with because he was inside Judas. The spirit of Satan was within Judas, and it was within the temple authorities and the Roman guards who were coming to grab Jesus. And again, these are the ten horns that are uniting against Christ. Ephesians 2.1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who now is at work in those in the sons of disobedience. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.12, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. 1 Corinthians 4.3, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age have blinded, who do not believe. And what do they not believe about? Be ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. That is righteousness by faith, friends. We have to take hold of that belief, and in Jesus Christ, we know when he lives in our life, we will be perfect because he will keep the law that we can't keep. Lest the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them, for we do not preach ourselves. And you contrast that with Laodicea, and she says, I am rich and increased with goods, and I don't need anything. The focus is never on us. It's always on Christ. So let's look... Um, a little bit at the king of the north and the king of the south. So this is a prophecy and a warning. In the time of the end, the professed people of God who have the sanctuary truth will be part of the Antichrist system. That's the amalgam beast that worships Satan and Lucifer. Satan plants his flag in the midst of Laodicea. This results in the people worshiping towards the east. Lucifer was son of the morning and his direction is the east. He wants to take the place of Jesus. And as we see in Ezekiel 43, 4, Jesus is coming from the east. But let's read about the king of the north and the king of the south. Daniel eleven forty. at the time of the end, of course, this is 1798, the king of the south shall attack him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. This is false Christianity, the king of the north, under the guise of the papacy. And then verse 45, And he, the king of the north, shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Now this is an entire study on its own, but if you look at this, this is within the so-called remnant church. The papacy has inserted his doctrine within the remnant church. That's how we know we're right at the time of the end, and that has happened in the 1980s within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination when they decided to worship the Roman Catholic God, the Trinity. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Again, heavenly places, this refers to the people who have the sanctuary doctrine, the sanctuary in heaven. And there is wickedness in that people that have that doctrine. And we read about that in Ezekiel 8, 15. 
Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun towards the east. This this uh, group of men, about 25, this is a steering committee within the general conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And just as it is written, it is composed of, quote, about 25 men. They are worshiping the sun. Isaiah 14, 12, How are you fallen o, from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Again, the sun rises in the east. How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? So let's ask one question then based on all of this false doctrine that we've been looking about, about the nature of Christ, that he came to the earth, he retained his divinity, he really didn't die, and that's how he overcame sin. Um, so what happens to the Laodicean people that retain this false doctrine? We'll read about it in Ezekiel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faces east. Again, the east gate of the Lord's house. These are the same people that we saw in Ezekiel chapter 8. Um, and there were 25 men, same 25 men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Asher, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in the city. And they say, the time is not near, this city is the cauldron, and we are the meat. That is the same thing um, that the church says now that the church goes through, the ship goes through. The Laodicean ship does not go through. Therefore prophesy against them, O son of man. You have feared the sword, I will bring a sword upon you, says the Lord, and I will bring you out of its midst and deliver you in the hands of strangers and execute judgments on you. You shall fall by the sword. I will execute you at the border of Israel. So the cherubim lifted up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain. This is the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of the city. And so here we have the idea of Ichabod. Um, the glory has departed. At the end of the 490-year prophecy, right before 70 AD, we know there were signs in heaven, and the glory departed the sanctuary there. And now in the antitype, it is doing the same thing. The glory has departed, and the glory rests on the Mount of Olives. And that is the next scene that picks up in Zechariah chapter 14, when the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to judge those who have not walked in the truth, which includes Laodicea. So I pray, brothers and sisters, that you will study additional on this topic of the nature of Christ. Jesus is our perfect example in all things. He led a perfect life by dying to self and letting the Father live in him. We can live that same perfect life if we have the mind of Christ, and that is what can obey the law according to the Spirit. Blessings to you in the name of Jesus.